So welcome everybody to the first of our masterclass series leading up to the New South Wales Smart Places Summit planned for June 22nd. Uh, my name is Ian Opperman and I'm going to facilitate this session today. But I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land with which meet, on which we meet today. Despite the fact that this is a virtual meeting, each and every one of us is on the lands of traditional Aboriginal elders. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to anyone who's here with us today. And in my case, it's the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. So thank you all very much for joining us. As I mentioned, this is our first of a series of 10, believe it or not, 10 masterclasses leading up to the New South Wales Smart Places Summit. What we have historically done around the important summits is to run a series of masterclasses to really surface important issues and to ensure that when we get to the summit itself, we're, we're talking about issues of real consideration that we've had time to soak in somewhat deeply. 10 may seem like quite a lot, but when you think about smart places, smart cities, there's, there is nothing more complex that you could possibly imagine than a smart city or a smart place. So our series of masterclasses, of course, starts with building trust when creating smart places. We'll talk about standards related to smart cities and smart places. We'll bridge data sharing, governance, AI, investing in smart cities and smart places, uh, some precincts thinking, all with the intention of ensuring that we've addressed major issues by the time we get to the, the, the 22nd of June for our Smart City Summit. So today we have the, the, the great honour of being led by Teresa Anderson and Doris Tia uh, Baljevic. And what they will effectively do is, is run us through a series of quite interactive discussions. What I'd ask you to do in order to, to facilitate this session running smoothly is, is please uh, stay on mute unless you're speaking, unless you're asking a question. I'll, I'll leave it up to Teresa and Dorothea to, to, to work out how interactive they want to be, at least initially. But the intention really is to have a good discussion, surface issues and get to the real substance. Building trust when creating smart places is really important because ultimately we're talking about government use of data, government using data in increasingly fine grain and specific ways. So if we if we can't build and maintain trust, then we've got a, a fundamental problem from the very outset. And so in order for, to run the session smoothly, just ask everyone to remain on mute. Uh, if you're having trouble with bandwidth, possibly turn off the video and put it back on when you're asking questions. Uh, questions can be posted in the chat and will be curated by Mark Portlock, who's joining us from the Australian Computer Society. And thanks very much to the Australian Computer Society for launching us or running these sessions today. And this evening's event will be recorded, so we'll let you know uh, where to access that recording at the conclusion of the session. So what I might do without further ado is hand over to Teresa and Dorotea to take us on what will be a fascinating journey. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Ian. No pressure of, at all to, to try to be fascinating, but I'm, I'm, I'm honoured to have been asked to put this together as the opening masterclass, and I'm really delighted to be working with Dorotea on this. And later you'll also be hearing from Sam Snedden, who is coming on as a discussant to share some of her insights as well. Uh, before we go any further, I too would like to pay my respects to the Indigenous custodians of the lands on which we are all meeting, and also to any First Nations people who are part of today's session. And now what we'd like to do is hear, insofar as we can in this um, digital space, we'd like to hear a little bit from, from everyone who is joining with us. So we have a little um, menti poll that we would like you to participate in right now, if you can. So, so there's the, the code and also in the chat, I think Mark is going to be putting the link so you can go straight to that. And then we'll bring it up after you've had a moment to look to look at the questions. And see. I'm just looking as well because I will participate. So we'll give you a moment. And then Dorotea, I'll let you drive.
So as you start putting your responses, we should see a live feed of what's going on. So if you picked your favorite device, it doesn't have to be the laptop. It can be any of your mobile devices, tablets. Hopefully we can start seeing what's going on. So only choose one of the pairs that you think you are coming in as today. We recognize some of you come from government, but are also researchers and potentially also in the industry. So we want to understand where you're actually working with. So on the left hand side, it's working with the structure or places, the technology versus maybe working directly or predominantly with humans. The other question is, are you making decisions with artificial intelligence and data or are you working directly with the AI? So we can see we've started getting responses from government, industry, researchers, and it's hovering in between actually, Teresa. Yeah, no, I'm just seeing that um, it's one that the code is is um, incorrect in there. So the original, it should be one, two, two, six. Um, so if anyone's trying to to enter, I was just I'm trying to multitask there. But yes, it is looking like it's moving around. I love this is this is where I love working with Menti to see to see what looks like little waltzes of data across the screen. And we can see we've got about 10 responses. So we're making it very transparent that this is number of people responding in and the typical look of what's happening with the different industries. But mostly hovering along in the center. When it comes to a point of saturation, we will then head into the other question. So just out of curiosity, if I hover on government, this actually shows the responses of those that actually communicate on government. This is where you stand. So some of you are working with humans directly, but a lot of you are working with the structure and tech. On the industry side, interestingly, mostly working or directly with AI. However, we've got a few in between structure tech and humans. With NGOs, again, hovering right bang in the center, but a couple of you are directly working with humans. Researchers, <laughs> as you can imagine, across the board, except very, very few are making decisions directly with AI, and we have a few in the other category. Teresa, happy to move along to the next question? I am. I was just answering a question there. There was, um, as as has been, um, something something that we thought might happen, in terms of the way that the questions are asked, there was there was some ambiguity mm -hmm. in terms of what it meant to be working directly with AI as opposed to making decisions with AI. Uh, and and this is I, I appreciate the question um, that was asked because it helps us to explain that that you know, there is this this distinction between the way that that we would operate if you had a, a, a lot of words to be able to explain or if you understood in advance the context of everyone who is coming in to answer a question. And in this case, we weren't quite sure of the contexts of everyone who was going to be in the room with us, especially as we can't see the room. Uh, so the, the idea of working directly with AI may not even apply if you're not dealing with AIs, in which case, if you are aware that you are working with making decisions, that have been informed in some way, shape, um, some way, shape or form by AI, you might put yourself at that end of the scale. But uh, also I, you might just be in the middle because either you're between the two or because you don't know. Uh, so, so that raises a really interesting challenge in terms of how we should trust this data, mm -hmm. uh, which again is the point of this exercise. So we are not using this for any sort of scientific <laughs> data gathering, I should also flag. But but really as a way to first off say, well, who's here and and uh, what kind of categories do we have represented? I'm really interested, Dorothea, if you could bring up who is in other, because other is one of my absolute favorite categories in any scale. How many how many others do we have? Unfortunately, this view can't give you the number of points, so it, it does oh, make sure that we've got anonymity at least, but you yeah, can count that's the very circles. Good, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, and this is, you know, again, 
Um, other is one of those categories that that is in in many cases overlooked. It's it's considered um, less important in some classification schemes than others. But if you think about it, other can also be a way of identifying what you have been missing in the assumptions that you are bringing in to a survey or to some um, data representations that you are trying to construct. So I suppose for in the interests of time and um, to see that we move on, let's let's go to the second question. And what we're asking here is free text. Uh, looks like someone's already put something in. Uh, what are you hoping to get out of this mastery or masterclass today? And this again will help Theresa and I frame of going a bit more deep in some of the sections, uh, perhaps a little lighter if uh, depending on the needs of everyone participating. So just free text can be a single word, can be a sentence. We appreciate it. it might be a little bit difficult on the phone. Great. Here we go. And I also um, I also see in the chat, Dorotea, that there's mm -hmm. a question from Tom where he says, well, why have we focused on AI in particular? And I should say, again, this was was for the for the purposes of, of an opening warm up um, exercise, but also, you know, the explanation you gave about what it is that you've worked on, Tom, you know, this flags exactly the the broad range of ways in which the term AI is used there. There is um, I don't know if Arling is with us, but but um, there is a whole standard being framed around ethical AI and conversations that that one one gets engaged in about how does one define what an AI is. So so for our purposes, it was really we're just trying to understand the relationship between the way that the people in our in our audience today are engaging either directly with humans or directly with technologies or working with data. Uh, we could have just as easily have said, are you working with data? So mm -hmm. so thank you for your um, patience in working with us. And so this word cloud is is um, looking very interesting. Yes, understanding mm -hmm. the space. Uh, I see a lot of words that are part of what what we've talked about covering Dorotea. So mm -hmm. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Sigh of relief, yes. <laughs> Um, and it also gives me a chance to flag. So so we're as you can well appreciate two hours uh, gives us so little time to scratch the surface on some very key issues and also allow for engagement um, and and to try to recognize some of the strengths as well as some of the challenges in working in this mediated context as opposed to being um, face to face. You'll have our contact details at the end of this master class or mastery class, and we are more than happy for you to get in touch with us. In fact, we're hoping that you will uh, to provide us not only feedback about the session, but to, to share some of your insight. You'll get those opportunities and breakouts, but also uh, if there's there are questions that we have not addressed either in the chats or, or in the posts, please do not take that as an indication that we are not interested in responding. It's more trying to focus on all the different devices in front of us and make sure that we move towards our set ending time of 6 p.m. So I, I do not wish to offend anyone by not um, reading or responding to questions that are on the screen. Uh, so so just, just to note that, and we have the history because this is all being recorded, we'll have all the questions. So in, in the fullness of time, as one says, we will go through those and, and respond. So thank you in advance for your patience. And I, I could freeze it right there. The fact that ethics is, is squarely in the middle. As a data and AI ethicist, I couldn't be happier. And I haven't even, and you know, I haven't even added a response. So I have not influenced the data on that. Uh, so that's perhaps a good time. Thank you again, everyone, for sharing with us. And, and we'll, we'll put together um, the final view of this Mentimeter later on and include that in the pack that we share with everyone uh, with our feedback, um, with our wrap up of, of the interaction components today. So I'd like to then, before we go on a little further, just give you a little snapshot of what our plan is for you today. So we're going to take a few mo moments right now not to get into detailed definitions, but just to try to help scene set around uh, what we're referring to as smart cities, smart places, data and trust, because these are three of the core themes that that will really shape what we're uh, discussing with you today. 
I'm going to share with you a, a working framework that I've been devising for a few years, and that was part of the, the pre-reading. This is where I can sound like a teacher. That was part of your assigned reading for today, not assigned, uh, recommended. But rest assured, I've put together a little crib sheet uh, to help you with the breakout if you haven't had a chance to read through that uh, paper. To, to basically give you some stimulus points to use to in that first breakout where we talk about what, what are some of the operating principles that we can use to try to build trusted partnerships in, in relation to working with data and AI when it comes to placemaking. Uh, then in the second half of our masterclass, Dorotea will, will kick us off with uh, a deeper dive into some case studies from her experience. Sam will also be sharing some of her insight. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move towards the, the really meaty bit about trying to work with a hypothetical scenario to put into practice some of what we're going to talk about, uh, which involves building accountable mechanisms and hopefully start sharing. But I can already tell we're going to run out of time in terms of full engagement. So please see this as the beginning of our time together and not as the end. So, Dorotea. Thank you very much, Teresa, and also acknowledging Ian for our wonderful and warm welcome. So, like Teresa mentioned, we are dealing with concepts that sound simple, trust, data and smart city, but how can we make sure we've got a common ground to lead us through the class today? So, typically, smart cities have these sort of connotations or these images. It's these IoT or intelligent devices that are connected some way through this ubiquitous cloud and it provides some form of insights. These insights then have a digital representation through the infrastructure, the transport, the telecommunication links to help manage, maintain that particular city. Now we are using smart city and we recognize that New South Wales government has used the term smart places. And this is actually very interesting. Why the different terms? Well, actually what you find in the research, which we've been doing internally, if we can go to the next slide, Mark, is unfortunately there is many different terms. So we've been doing, going back to the academia world, a traditional literature review around what is a smart city. So if you go back to, if you remember uni days or even high school days, you have a search term, but you also need to understand the associated terms that really mean the same thing. This is not a comprehensive list, but what you see is it's been inundated in the academic material, in the industry material, the standards bodies on very, very similar, if not the same topics, digital, intelligent city, information city, circular economy, circular cities, even autonomous cities and smart places. So it's acknowledging that what today we're talking about is all of this in one form of a definition. So we know what city means, but smart, or even intelligent is very, very hard to grasp. So what is one best way to try and get inspiration? It's through imagination of cartoons. So if anyone remembers in the 1950s and 60s, it's the wonderful world of the Jetsons. And if you recall, actually a lot of the things that they were forecasting have started to come true. But one of the things that they were talking about or what was observed was a lot of the community were living in these apartment blocks, the sky pads as an example, that would move up and down or get raised or lowered depending on the weather or unfortunately forecasting pollution and climate. But is this really what we're talking about, the intelligence, the smart place or the autonomy of the city? Is this what we're trying to build? Let me try and counter that with some things in history. And the first one is for any of the history buffs is something that was found on one of the Greek islands, and this is on the screen right now. It was found in 1901 on the island of Antikothera, and hence it's called the Antikothera mechanism. It's actually over 2000 years old, and is often recognized as the first analog computer. It's an astronomical mechanism. It can look at lunar movements, solar movements, planetary movements, forecast climate in 19 years, and researchers are finding it's been quite accurate. Now, all of those definitions that we saw before around intelligence, digital, it had a connotation of technology. I remember the images that I showed around IoT devices and again, the ubiquitous cloud. It's very much almost related to our current information age. So would we not consider this mechanism as intelligent and smart? 
Did it not help the Romans travel through the oceans down to Greece? It was helping that community. Let's take it a bit more local. What about the traditional landowners of Australia? Extraordinarily respectful to the current lands, very insightful, had huge custodianships in how to manage the environment, the climate, the flora and the fauna. And it is now being recognised in New South Wales government in terms of the architectural standards of connecting with country. In actual fact, in some traditional lands, they don't just recognise the changes in seasons by arbitrary dates. They actually look at it with a slight adjustment of what's happening with patterns of behaviour, with the flora, with the fauna, and then they can actually adjust themselves. Is that not smart or intelligent for a city or a place? Again, not really technology or digital being underpinned by it. So how can we try and provide one level of a definition? So based on this literature review, there was a common definition coming across, which was academic in material. And that definition is presented on the screen now. Smart cities are defined through concurrent combination of single aspects ranging from innovation to education and quality of life. It doesn't mention technology. It doesn't mention digital in actual fact. It's actually a little bit obtrusive. What is it actually trying to say? So there's basically much more to a city or a smart city or place than just the digital, the IoT and the transport is the social and the cultural elements. And what the sad thing is, when you look through the hundreds of indicators around smart cities, and most of them are skewed to the technology and the digitization. When they try and quantify how good from a cultural point of view, you have things like, does it have access to broadband services? What's in the shopping cart of the system? And this is a great segue when Teresa is now going to talk about, well, how does the data and technology evolve into the smart city? Thank you, Dorothea. So what, what I've put on the screen next, and, and you will have access to these slides and the links to the literature that we're referencing here as well. So this, um, uh, you'll be talking about standards uh, related to smart cities in a subsequent masterclass. But for right now, I wanted to flag a definition that comes out of Standards Australia's Smart Cities Standards Roadmap, where um, there's this connection to data and technology uh, and a city's goals. And I think if you look internationally at the way that smart city is used, even when the focus is on data and technology, there is this this chewing and froing between social policy, physical engineering, between the needs of the city um, as articulated and reflected in overarching plans, but also then uh, the aspirational uh, pursuit of ways of using data and technology to make better. Uh, but not just to go and do things better, but to think about ways of improving um, the health and well being of. Uh, the populations that are, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word subjected, but that are are in the, the context within which these, these technologies and these data sets are being operationalized. So we're going to come back to that in relation to New South Wales government as part of your scenario. Uh, I did also want to then um, move on uh, to, to just say that for the purposes of what I want us to take into the, the first breakout, uh, so the next slide, please, Mark. Uh, I want you thinking really about taking an ecological view. So seeing the city as more than data, as more than people, as more than the built environment, and really trying to understand uh, urban ecologies uh, in, in all that complexity and that messiness. Thinking about the technical and the human, the physical as well as the social, and critically, what is seen as well as what is not um, visible to us. So when I say invisible, there's there's a whole um, uh, conversation to be had around what constitutes invisibility and why and to whom. And again, I'm happy to discuss that with anyone uh, off channel afterwards. Uh, I'd also invite you to to read the the paper that I've referenced for this, because uh, this does get to the heart of some of the the political issues around ways of enabling communities who are not seen to be made visible. And we're going to try to exercise some of that today. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. I sort of feel like I should have a little um, bell that goes off. 
I'm I'm particularly uh, excited by the way that people like Jared Thorpe talk about turning data around. And and I relate this to the work that I do on compassionate data science. This statement comes out of a Medium article, a blog post that Jared wrote many years ago that, that still resonates with me. It's a really powerful story uh, that I welcome you to look at uh, if you haven't done so already. And there's this quote from Jane Jacobs that he draws on that in creating city success, we human beings have created marvels, but we left out feedback. And what can we do um, with our cities to make up for this omission? How do we allow the city, both the physical and the social elements, to tell us what's happening? And, and I suppose data and technologies and the way that they're, they are sought to be used in smart cities and connected cities and um, smart places are seeking uh, to, to hear, to get that feedback from cities. But again, there are consequences if we are not paying attention to what is made invisible in different contexts. So, so I'm really interested in having us think about how data becomes data. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. And these are the kinds of questions that, that I've been focused on for the last few years as a data ethicist, uh, which again will be shaping the way that I'm hoping we will be discussing trust today and trust building because what we're trying to do is take a humanist perspective on this and think about the ways that we can make the invisible visible, uh, particularly in terms of recognizing, uncovering and addressing uh, missing underrepresented and misrepresented people or ideas, um, concepts, communities, um, objects, uh, creatures, uh, again, taking that full ecological perspective. And on the next slide, I've, I've just tried to, um, I was trying to think about some, some key phrases to just give you to plant some of the ways that, that I, I would welcome you to be thinking about data uh, as part of this trust building uh, session that we're doing today. And whether you are dealing with data directly in the spreadsheets or you're dealing with the consequences of the way that data has been used to help inform a decision, I think it's really valuable for us to think, to remember that, that, that a lot of big data, even if it isn't directly about people, is, is when we're talking cities and places, we're talking about places where human beings are. And behind every data point is a human being. And the data that comes to represent, whether perfectly or imperfectly, um, what we think of as human practice, it has an origin well before it ends up in a spreadsheet. And we need to find ways to become more minded about those processes of becoming. Uh, that mindfulness is what's going to help us to try to address, I won't say resolve, uh, the unintentional biases and, and those, those practices that can contribute and in fact perpetuate issues of inequity and bias. Next slide, please, Mark. So the other thing to keep in mind with this uh, is, is that when we're categorizing data, again, as you saw in our opening exercise, uh, I take the perspective of data categorization as a pro provocation. So this, this flies in the face of assumptions that, that data has a set place to exist. Because really those, uh, I love this quote from, this was my former boss, Simon Buckingham Shum, uh, data points in a graph are tiny portholes into a rich human world. So again, data helps, gives us, gives us an understanding of human practice. It gives us an understanding of our world, but it is one of many ways of understanding that world. So recognizing that they are proxy indicators. So it's as much as we want them to try to represent um, practices and ideas and people, we must be mindful of the fact that, that those categorizations uh, are shaped by practices that existed before we started to, to create the, the spreadsheet, say, in this instance. And I'm, I'm going to stop there solely because I, uh, you know, that, that could be a whole another passionate conversation um, with me uh, because that's, that's something I feel very strongly about. Uh, what I do want to then say is that I think those issues around um, trust within data are something that we're seeing increasingly come to the fore in the last few years when we've seen more talk about mistrust and distrust, particularly in relation to the infodemic, which is something that, that um, as an information scientist uh, and as a trained librarian, we've dealt with infodemics uh, for quite some time. 
but it's interesting how this has now come into our everyday vocabulary as a consequence of campaigns of misinformation and disinformation. And also then on the other side, floods of material that supposedly are, are um, available to help us make sense of the pandemic. Uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer, I, I just put one clip in here and then another two snapshots on the next slide to just show you, I think there's some interesting observations um, in, in the barometer over the last two years that show that increasingly there is this this recognition through the surveys that, that the Edelman um, group have done that show that, that people are starting to become more mindful of the necessity for information literacy. I'd go so far as to say um, data literacy, digital literacy, technical literacies. And increasingly, we're starting to see that, that organizations and governments and um, companies are being held accountable in relation to foundational problems and not just uh, the, the aspects that, that they might be singularly responsible for. Next slide, please, Mark. So, so I want us to bear in mind that human experience really is, it has to be appreciated that it is far richer than anything that is going to be codified within an AI system or in data technologies. And we have to acknowledge that and, and try to avoid what I think of as the seductive availability of what I call low-hanging data. Uh, and, and I'm not seeking to cause offense. I'm not saying to not use that. But what I'm saying is that, that I think we, if we want to build trust with the community, we have to find ways to deal with the, the difficult matters at higher in the tree, to deal with the, com the complex issues that are not as easily put into data. Uh, to, to deal with those, those categorizations that are problematic, to take risks and deal with adversity. And that doesn't mean risky behaviors, but it means um, acknowledging the, the difficult road ahead and finding ways to collectively work um, and to be sensitive to those members of our community who are particularly vulnerable as a consequence of actions we might take. Next slide, please, Mark. And so for me, this is this is framed as what I call compassionate data science. Uh, and and I think that that it's a I would put to you that this is a way of thinking of ways to work with human and machine components in the city uh, to contribute towards human and planetary flourishing, to to find ways to not just work with the, the data that we have, to not just deal with what we know, but to also find ways to develop the imaginative capacity that we as humans need to be able to solve problems and to work really well um, and innovatively, innovatively with our data and AI technologies. So next slide, please. I also think, and I, I think I flagged this a little bit before, this idea that we have to move away from the idea of thinking that data speaks for itself. Uh, I think recognizing that it's given a voice uh, by what we do with it and also by the, the mechanisms by which we are interpreting or gathering or filtering that data. Uh, and that plays critical roles in the way that data is converted into insight. And in the exercise we're going to do later today, I'm going to, to suggest some ways that you might um, find beneficial for your own purposes uh, in, in the work that you're doing or uh, in conversations you have with communities that you're seeking to, to help advocate for more ethical approaches to working with data uh, in the context that they find themselves. Next slide, please, Mark. And then another thing to keep in mind in terms of trying to build trust uh, in relation to data and technologies, I think is wrapped up, and I deliberately wanted to use this quote because this is not a new phenomena. So, so in the earlier part of last century, in fact, this is what this quote comes from. And, and I just love this mantra. A map is not the territory it represents, but if it is correct, it has a similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness. So we can use data simulations. We'll talk about digital twins further in these master classes. And I think these are incredibly powerful resources that we can use, provided that we recognize that a map is not the territory. The map helps us to understand that territory. But if we are gaining new knowledge, if we are learning as we go, 
then our maps should be changing and our understandings should be changing. And so that means that we need to be adapting not only our technologies, but we also need to be learning to develop the cognitive capacities to be able to handle those uncertainties. Next slide, please, Mark. So these key operating principles that I want you to take into um, the breakout session are, are what I've proposed. And um, I, as I said, I have a little cheat sheet for you. I hate to use that term, a synopsis um, that, that you'll have in, in your breakout where, where I've been reflecting for some time. This was something I was working on for a few years now, how we keep the human in our technology design to design and deploy uh, machines and technologies that can support and also extend our thinking. So on the next slide, what I am showing you are just some of the, the key operating principles. And the third and the fourth, I think, deal specifically with trust. So interestingly, though, the second one around indecision is something that the Edelman Trust Barometer last year, no, not the Edelman Trust Barometer, the um, countdown clock from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, when they moved the countdown clock closer to midnight, which is very destructive, one comment that they made was that it's not just climate, uh, the risk of uh, around the climate crisis, the risk of nuclear annihilation, it's also indecision that is causing difficulty on our planet. So I think uh, that makes it a really critical uh, principle for us to keep in mind. And thinking about well-being and how that can drive the ethics of our system, and finally, participatory design. How can we design with rather than simply for? So, so on the next slide, I have um, sought to just give this one example in terms of building trust with well-being as a driver, using some of the work that I've done, looking at different ways of training data scientists and working with organizations um, with what I what I call the four R's. So, thinking about ways that you can build trust um, by working to provide reassurance by repairing a trust deficit. So that means dealing with the consequence of behaviors that may be beyond your control, that you had nothing to do with, but have created a history into which you are walking and, and you need to respect. Uh, resilience is very much about nurturing your individual capacities and the capacities of your communities, building relationships. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. And also, unfortunately, we are talking reflection, it's very hard to, to say we need to have time to think when I keep watching the clock and saying I want to make sure that we have time for you to speak and engage. Uh, but, but there you have it. This is finding that balance between the fast and the slow, um, but having empathy. And again, thinking about different ways of turning data around and being humanist in our approach. And, and so this question of trying to create very educated and activated and informed citizens who can be a part of the work that we're doing is therefore really important for trust building in any context, but I think specifically in cities where humans are such a critical part of the environment. So I've also then, as I've tried to show on the next slide, uh, and again, it's on your uh, crib notes, I've come up with some keystone practices that are shaped, that are um, informed by the work I've been doing for a few years now in terms of trying to locate uh, trust building and ethical data practices within a socio-technical way of dealing with data and AI. And, and as you move into your group, so you'll, you'll, you'll see the, the notes in the Google Doc that you have. What I'd really like to hear from all of you in your discussions uh, is, or have you engage with in your discussions, is, is, is whether these keystone practices, so working off that idea of the keystone being being something that's foundational, being something that's very critical to the survival uh, of an ecology. Uh, it really feels like thinking about collective action instead of individual action is, is, is something very important for us for moving forward. Civility, um, the last few years have definitely shown that we need to find ways to, to work from a principle of mutual respect. Even if we can't agree with one another, we must be respectful of one another. Clear and consistent communication, even when you don't know an answer, to be clear in communicating what you know and what you don't know. Uh, and admitting that and owning that uncertainty seems really important. And, it, and connection to country, as Dorotea introduced us to, and appreciating complexity. Uh, and, and I think the mechanisms for accountability that we'll talk about in, in the scenario in the second half of the session 
will will also um, build further on this notion of commitment. So, sorry, I feel a little out of breath. I, I wanted to try to, to give an overview, recognizing that uh, I was trying to sum up an entire paper uh, for you. And to warm you up as you get ready for your group work, I'm going to, to ask Sam to say a little bit um, because she's had a head start on thinking about whether or not these operating principles and keystone species connect to her work. Uh, so thank, you. Thank, thank you so much and, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to chat with you today. Um, just as a, as a brief introduction, um, I, I wear two hats. The, the first hat really is as co-chair of the IoT Alliance, which is the, the peak body for the Internet of Things. And as you're all familiar, sort of, um, IoT runs through so much of what smart city is, is all about. Um, and the second is as the founder of a startup um, in the agri tech space, really working with data um, and very much sort of coming across all the issues or many of the issue, issues that have been sort of raised, raised today. So, so my perspective really is one of um, an industry player um, trying to, to use data in the way that we really believe it can be used. And that is, how do we actually access data um, and, and use it for real innovation in my perspective or from my perspective across the agri-tech or in agricultural space? So I think it's very important and you're all very familiar with the, the, the concept of fair data, um, you know, data that is good data and data that enables innovation having to be both um, findable um, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, but I think that the most important principle from the perspective of today's discussion is around accessibility, um, not just around open data and data being available to everybody, but data that might be private for a number of, of, of um, reasons, either commercial or because of security issues, really making sure that there is clarity and transparency around data governance. And I think um, this sort of underpins a lot of what um, needs to be done in terms of the nexus between um, where we want to go, industry and other community stakeholders. And I guess um, from the perspective of, of, of industry, and I talk about agriculture, not really a smart city, but certainly a smart place, there's been a lot of great experience, I think, in terms of how the, the, agri the agricultural ecosystem has come together um, both farmers themselves, who really are the source of much of the very valuable data that, that is available for innovation, um, researchers, agri-tech and others to create a very viable and workable code around which everybody can actually build trust. And I think that's something that might be useful in terms of the discussion later today. So there's lots of people to talk and say, and I know that everybody else wants to, to sort of have their, their say, but um, that really is the perspective that, I, that I'd like to bring, is how to actually, um, from an industry perspective, engage across the ecosystem to float the data that's really, really valuable and actually which has the potential um, for real innovation and, and really sort of changing um, the scene for all of us today. Does that help? Is that enough? Very much so. Thank, thank you, Sam, for that. We're, um, as I said, we're we're seeking to to find ways to share with you some different perspectives to get you started. And now we want to, um, as much as we can, give you some time to go into a breakout and using this this first half as a as a stimulus to to share some thoughts of your own uh, with one another. Uh, I'm also going to ask you, you'll see some instructions in the breakout reference uh, Google Doc that Mark has just shared with everyone. If you bring that, that open when you go into your group, uh, you'll, you'll see that I'm asking you to pick a scribe, pick someone who can, who can just record now. You don't need to do this digitally. If you want to scribble notes uh, on a piece of paper or if you're using post-its or whatnot, that's, that's perfect. What we're going to ask you to do when you come back in, uh, the person who ha it has that responsibility will, will be able to uh, snapshot that, either cut and paste it in if you've been writing it digitally or add that photo to our shared document so that we can see what everyone's doing. So see you soon. Yep. <laughs>
And so, you know, and you say to people, some people will say, well, look, I, no, I, I'd kill the old, the old man because the kid's still got his life ahead of him. You know? and, and then you say, okay, what happens if... We've uh, been rejoined happens, to the, to the bigger group yours? now, Phil. Yep. Yes, I think yep. we've... We, Everyone's we've, been we've moved back into the main room. Yep. Unceremoniously yep. been moved back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll use your example, thing. Philip. Okay. It's I'll a good example. You're the, rep, you're the yeah. rapporteur then, <laughs> Okay, we are at least we're familiar with that example. I was familiar with uh, something similar to the one you gave, so we'll use that one. So as we all come tumbling back in, uh, we were having a great conversation, uh, which was clearly running over time in that little breakout group, and uh, we got a one minute warning and then we came tumbling back in. So <laughs> hopefully we didn't interrupt your conversation. It was actually just getting. Well, no, I was, oh, I was still talking and on, on, on the screen because I didn't have. Enough screens. Well, there we, we, we were discussing the first paragraph of the Google Doc, which referred to six principles when they were affected. <laughs> there, there is a oh, did there. I? Oh, sorry. Did we, that we thought that was just a test us. So we were paying attention. <laughs> Theresa, you did that on purpose, didn't you? I don't. No, sorry. I um, because I was trying. I was. I was. I was trying to. Uh, abbreviate it so that it all fit into one page and then I got rid of the operating principles and the keystone practices and I tried to merge them. I'm very sorry. That's that's the limitations of proofreading. But <laughs> but it, it, that's a perfect um, segue for me to say that's how you move perfectly and perfectly forward. Uh, <laughs> and and also if there is sufficient trust in the room, as I feel there is, I feel there's a lot of trust and a lot of love in the room, then <laughs> then my my errors will be uh, forgiven in that regard. Uh, for that, but uh, sorry, sorry for that. Those who know me will not be surprised when I say we have to stop using this word trust. Uh, it's not trust we want, it's trustworthiness. Yes, thank you. That is trust, trust um, is a problem. Yeah, yeah. It's to be worthy of trust. That that is um, again uh, that is that is very much at the at the heart of the way that I have sought to frame it, not just in what I'm writing, but what we're going to do in the second half of, of our masterclass or mastery class. Because, you know, first you have to earn trust and you have to be worthy of trust and trust has lots of different, different meanings. So I see all the little um, dots working to share the report backs. And in the interest of time, uh, we won't have a lot of time to speak with each group, but I'm I'm hoping there's there's been enough time for you to have some chat within that small cluster. Again, this is uh, the the um, the face to face just feels so much more um, uh, conducive to to being able to to have uh, a discussion and to to look around a shared document and and work through that, especially when we're talking about setting up the conditions for building trust. Which is, which is again really where where we're going with this. Um, one thing that that we talked about in in our little breakout um, that that Ian asked me to share, which which I, I think is a, a nice way to then get into a case study that uh, Dorotea is going to take us through, uh, relates to the I guess one of the context within which I was writing the paper that that served as the stimulus for for the presentation I just gave. And I was doing it at a time when, you know, all of us were sitting listening to the news about COVID outbreaks and hotspots. And I remember at one point, I, I was really, I was really impressed with the fact that, that the, the way that, that Premier Berejiklian was always introducing the, the reporting on, well, what's happening in New South Wales and, and what is the status uh, there, there was a reference to the fact, well, OK, we let me just let you know how we are going about our thinking. This is how we are making our decision. And I think that sense of showing your hand uh, as you move forward is very important for that trust building. So so communicating certainty as well as uncertainty is really critical and not just saying to people, look, we're making the decision. And you have to trust that we're making the decision appropriately but to try to let people in on some of the ways that you're moving forward. And, I, and I, I'm hoping that as we continue to talk about this idea of working with 
technologies for smart places and and supporting communities and and promoting well-being that we we also recognize that that human element uh, and appreciate the risk in terms of moving forward. Um, what is it cautiously? No, is it? Deliberately and cautiously. Deliberately and cautiously moving forward. Uh, that you can do that when you have a trust framework that allows allows you to to share and admit when challenges and when errors might occur, because you then also have mechanisms for dealing with that. And we're going to do some of that in, in this last hour. So, so scribes, thank you very much for scribing, either typing in or just putting snapshots. It's more that report back is to allow Dorotea and myself to, to um, create some kind of a distillation that we can share with everyone. And now I'm going to um, unspotlight myself and turn it over to Dorotea to give a deep dive. Yes, thank you, Teresa. And there was certainly very interesting conversations in the group. I was I was trying not to influence them. So they, how's that for trust? <laughs> I was only trying to nudge them in the right direction around the operating principles, Teresa. So trying to make sure they've got the right mechanisms in place. And I won't say which group we were in. So what I do want to do is share a couple of case studies related to around smart places or smart buildings, but I want to lead into a, a particular story. And I will start with the work that I was talking about prior, where it's being led by um, a young woman in our team around the literature review on smart cities and the indicators. So there is going to be a separate session um, around the standards themselves. However, there is something that was quite interesting in the approach that she was taking, saying the indicators at present have almost five different types. They can't be treated equally, and in actual fact, they actually address different parts of a smart city or a place. Some look purely at the inputs, some purely look at the outcomes in terms of what has been successful of the smart city, or maybe not so successful in the expectations, and others on the impact. However, what has been interesting is they do refer to common themes, and those common themes actually look like, if you would take the next slide, please, Mark, this, which was not too dissimilar to what most of you are aware of. This is your forte. Natural environment, built environment, waste, transport, energy, essentially the foundations of any city. Now we're just taking an extract. The right hand side actually shows at the highest level the combination of themes and all of those hundreds of indicators across the board. So if we've got so many of these indicators, what are the metrics behind the scenes and why do we need to have a collection of literally thousands to ten thousands to indicate if something is a smart city? Is that we continue to learn something new about ourselves every single time? Has the environment adapted? Now, while COVID is very topical, it's not like pandemics haven't happened in the past. So let's just take a little bit of a step back to see what's occurred in the past around pandemics and how it's impacted the social and built environment. So this is some work that we've been doing also internally just to get a bit of a litmus test of what's happening. So it's not a comprehensive list. We are not uh, microbiologists or epidemiologists by any means, but just to understand what's been happening from a historical lens. So Black Death, 14th century, introduced quarantine, obviously many deaths. Definitely not the same level of population as today, but the change to the built world was to start actually decreasing the amount of crampedness, making it a bit more spaced out, reducing the dirtiness in the neighborhoods. Tuberculosis, again, 2 billion people worldwide impacted. We had sanatoriums, social isolation. What do you start seeing? Trend towards summer homes. So vitamin D, fresh air, light. How does that start impacting the difference between their primary home versus their summer home? COVID. We see differences in the ventilation and in fact some projects actually rethought what they could have to do in terms of the built environment. So it's not dissimilar to what's been happening in the past that we need to adjust our built environments. We need to adjust our smart cities. But is it really pandemics? No. We unfortunately we have tsunamis, we have um, earthquakes, we have cyclones. We have worldwide events like Olympic Games. We can all gather together. The Pope arrives to our 
particular country, a dignitary or a president comes around, we have to adjust the mechanisms of how they move, the weather and the climate. So actually what we're saying is we need to somehow use all of that information and how we can do that is with data and technology. Now the problem is, um, if we can go back one slide, Mark, the data and technology, specifically our relationship with it, is in a bit of a dichotomy. We say on one hand, we trust it. It can save forests. It can heat up the climate race. It's really positive. It's our vision. Versus you heard a little bit of what Teresa was talking about. Big tech has failed us. There's biases. It's a false uh, infodemic. And this is a specific report that has come from the Edelman um, Trust Barometer, but specifically on tech. So we've got a bit of an issue. We know we need data and technology to help underpin our smart cities and places. Technology is not going to get there. So what about all of our information sources? Well, actually, what we start to see in the next slide is there's been a decrease in the trust across the board globally from what our societies, our communities are absorbing from the information sites. Now, this has steadily been going down since 2019. So we can't trust maybe the technology and the data. There's a skepticism. We can't trust our information sources. So how do we make sure instead of saying maybe trust, as we heard, I think it was Philip, trustworthiness in the approaches that we do for building those smart cities. And this is exactly what I want to be talking around in the case studies around a third operating principle that you might have actually touched upon. And the way that we're talking about it is the communal well-being. That should actually dictate the driving of the ethics of the system, not the technology, not the people that are building the system, not the people that may be necessarily deemed as only the experts in the room. It's actually the people that live, breathe and play in those communities. So we're designing with the city rather than for the city. So internally where I work, we refer to it as responsible use of data. And you might have seen that in your pre-reading. So I, I'm not a teacher, so <laughs> I'm OK with you not having been able to read it. But essentially the premise behind the scenes is just because we have the data doesn't mean we need to use it. Just because we can put a sensor in doesn't mean it's necessarily right. Just because we are able to potentially anticipate someone's move, the buildings, the climate, does that necessarily mean we should do that? And does our community want us to do that? So where I work, we deal with retirement living, commercial buildings, retail, residential, commercial precincts. So that's quite a wide variety from a community perspective. Now, you might say in a retirement living village, wouldn't it be great if we had sensors in their bathroom floor? So if we realized if over 10 minutes they were there, we might have to call emergency services. Is that something they want? Is that something that they need? Well, how about in retail centers, which is becoming very topical? Let's have facial recognition to determine of the happiness factor, the movement of people. Again, is that what they really want from a consumer point of view? Or are we just hoarding data unnecessarily? So there's the question of the data ethics. And then there is a second topic. There is a group of people that have been extraordinarily influential in terms of the investment, a la the investment managers. So some of you might have seen the open letter by BlackRock CEO to all investors and um, companies. More should be done with environmentally friendly companies. That's great. And now last week there was another announcement saying ESG is now driving mergers and acquisitions fundraising. Now, who is making the metrics or indicator to say this is a environmental, social and governance related company or it's an environmentally friendly company? Which indicator are they using? So we know that there's hundreds of them. We know that there is a number of standards. Who are they talking to to make sure it's actually using the right investment vehicles to fund the right projects in place. And this is why it's important having this multidisciplinary lens and view and working with the community rather than those necessarily that have all the power. We don't always have the answers. So before I dive into the case studies, I want to add a different lens. So we know there's the problems with data ethics, so we need to make sure that's exposed. We know that investment is now driving and very interested in this area, so we want to make sure that they go down the right paths. The third is the complexity. And this is an interesting study that was done by two primary researchers on having a look 
at the Alexa Home Automation System. They decided to trace from the voice automation of the voice commands all the way to the algorithms in the data centers and even to the e-waste, what happens to that piece of data and the data stream. This is not meant to be legible by any means, but I do recommend you to view it at uh, the high resolution PDF. They identified all the roles involved in the process. They identified risks at every step of the way, which is that little bar with all the little dots next to it on the left hand side. They recognized that it was very difficult when it got to the algorithms to understand where the data had been used. And eventually when it went to the e-waste, they were shocked to find that it had been in countries like Ghana and Pakistan. Now this is, you might say, one intelligent IoT sort of device. But when we're talking about scales in smart cities, this is devices having to communicate and talk to one another. So if this is just one, how can you guarantee with certainty that this is a trustworthy system? We're using data for right. So let me start with one of my first case studies. So as mentioned, work with commercial buildings, and there is a number of building managers and portfolio managers that have decades of experience. Now I will acknowledge that my background is not in property and construction, but my team and I do have a lot around data. So one of the areas was understanding how we can best serve our commercial buildings. And again, remember these have, people have decades of experience in their own rights. They have seen many buildings. And one of the individuals came to us and said, look, I know everything about our data. Fantastic. Done everything that I need to do from the analysis. All we really need is people counting census. My team and I thought, wow, OK, they've done the research on our behalf. Um, so let's understand what people counting census are. So they look a little bit like this. You have the ones that are quite rudimentary, which are literally as some figure moves across the board or a threshold, it's a ticker. Sometimes, unfortunately, they can have a little bit of duplicate uh, counting because you can go in and out and it still double counts you. Some have a bit of an algorithm to error check that, all the way to facial recognition for uniquely identifying people. And then we thought, Hold it, why do they need people counting centers in commercial buildings? And why to such a large scale has this been recognized as the core need? Now, of course, in the name, they want to count people, but is that really at the crux of it? What is the building manager really trying to understand and do? And their role is actually managing the building managing the energy consumption, the security events, the cleaning facilities, making sure that the uh, environment is being meeting the scope one, two, three emissions, and of course, comfort of the occupants who are people. And what's the key dynamic in understanding this? It's the number of people and how are they traveling in and out of a building or in and out of floors. It's extraordinarily frustrating for a building manager, facilities manager, when you had an event that was meant to have 150 people, except 600 turn up. All of a sudden, we are, in, as individuals, little uh, heating radiation mechanisms, so the room gets very, very hot. And all of a sudden, sorry, stay on that last slide, <laughs> Mark, that's the second use case. All of a sudden, the room gets uncomfortable, and I'm sure all of us have been in that situation. So you get a call from the facilities manager, they cramp up the air conditioning because that's the only way that it will settle down to a comfortable 21 to 22 degrees, except what happens to the people under the air vents? They're freezing. Energy consumption has gone up unnecessarily. You're potentially using much more and you're not meeting your environmental targets, which can impact energy ratings like neighbors. So actually at the core was it, how can we help them equip what we can do with people? Now we said to them, what if we can give you a pseudo or approximation and uh, Teresa had a wonderful way of calling it proxy indicator. They said, no, we will not be able to trust this. People counting is the only way. So a data scientist and I decide to have a look at the elevator or lift system. So that's the current way people enter a building, how they enter a floor. What if you could be able to use some of that data to indicate no individual security access details, just an aggregate, what's happening throughout? Originally, they said, no way can we trust this data. We sat down with them to explain step by step, and there was a pause and a reflection. Actually, that's what we need. This may just work. 
Now remember that Alexa example. If you start rolling that out in every single building, who's going to manage it? Who's going to maintain it? Where is that data going? Where do we not know it's potentially resulting in e-waste? Is it actually overcomplicating it when something could have been done in a proxy method? They don't need to care about is it 59 versus 65 people. What they do need to know is within a certain threshold, how can I manage those operations? Now the second example, <laughs> we can go to the next slide, Mark, was a different example where they didn't exactly know what they wanted, but at a high level, it was understanding in a particular precinct that is currently being built in a region not in Australia, that's what I can tell you, around footfall, uh, essentially how traffic is moving in and out uh, of pedestrians. This is an area where it has residential, it has retail, but it also has commercial. And they said that we could have, uh, sorry Mark, just the last slide if we can, uh, we can give you Wi-Fi data to understand how people are connecting through the precinct. Okay, fantastic. So this is typically what Wi-Fi data can actually tell you. It gets produced in a heat map with the red denoting actually the most uh, usage or most location of where everyone is versus the blue being to the lesser extent. And that gives you a nice understanding. Maybe at the top there is a Burger King, maybe at the bottom there is a um, supermarket and you can understand where the activations are going. However, once we receive the data, our heat map actually looks like the next slide in which uh, you might have seen a glimpse of what Mark showed. For your benefit, I've actually concluded a yellow circle so you can zero in and actually see what our dilemma was. The data only showed three areas of concentrated activity. The two on the right and a some small amount on that left hand side. You could almost see this perfect triangle. Now, because none of us had actually been in this particular region in that country, we weren't sure what was going on. We thought, look, maybe that's possible. This area is still being built up. And the people that we were talking to in that particular region were very uh, intuitive. They said, what we want to do is we make, want to make sure that there's comfort as we start looking at this footfall. Why? If you've ever been to a newly construction site, you've got a lot of wind coming in. Once everything is built, it's nice and cozy and warm. However, prior to that, that might deter people from returning to this precinct. Another thing is at the top, there's a train station. At the bottom, there's a stadium. So they want to make sure that if there is any events, people feel safe to continue to return there. If there continues to be maybe some you know, drunk participants, they might again not come back. So they want to predict footfall. So we asked them the question, OK, is this the only access points on the area? And is this the only area that has buildings? They actually said no. It's everything that you see on the map. So instead of just saying we've got a problem with the data or we consider the data truthful, what we did was to take another step back. Now, a bit of a background. I actually started my career as a network engineer, so I was very familiar with access points and I decided to dive deeper with my team on understanding the configuration. And to find where someone is, you almost need three different points to help triangulate. What we looked at was actually it'd been configured to two. So that means it would be highly biased, hence why you see this odd triangle there. Second factor was what was happening with all the other access points? They actually weren't emitting any data. Only 30% of that location had data being transmitted. So the young data scientist that my team, he was so concerned, we're going to fail on this prototype, we can't present a null result. But what we could do actually is educate. We can explain that we need to improve the access points. There's some issue there. We need to improve the configuration. And if you wanted to factor in weather, uh, weather patterns, maybe you can have a temporary weather station. So what did this actually look like? So on the next slide, Mark, we started in December 2019. We had clarity on the prototype they wanted uh, footfall. We got the acquisition and we finished our prototype in June. So that's around six months. Now for the remaining eight months, we didn't hear from them. So remember we asked, ideally you fix up the access points. Ideally you, you uh, actually give us a bit more um, information so we can give you a robust footfall. But we didn't hear anything at all. And we thought, have we done something wrong? Then all of a sudden in February and March, they come back to us and say, 
everything's been fixed. We have verified the data for you. We've installed a weather station. We've given security events there. We've given you activations of where the retail is in order for us to be successful together. Now, if you had asked your manager potentially and they said over a year it has taken you to do this, but there's something very important. And that was actually the trust between the teams and the communities there. The first one happened in February and March. In our early uh, conversations, this region has legalized facial recognition, including facial recognition for the police force. However, the people that we were talking to were sharing their sentiments, especially with the community, that they didn't want facial recognition. They had a complete outrage over it and they did not want us to implement it, even though it was legal. So they did not want that to be calculating from a footfall point of view. So explaining the responsible use of data and only using it for the intended purpose that the community wants, it started building common ground that we weren't just data scientists using it for the purpose of having data and it's some crazy insight. The second factor is when we were sharing our learnings and having understanding of this is what we've been doing in Australia, by the way, this is what we're doing in our other experiments. While they were remaining quiet or not providing any feedback, they actually were absorbing all of this to help build much robust data science uh, data set for us to use now. Now this is extraordinarily important. Then you could say you could have accelerated the process, perhaps, but now we're heading towards the right direction and we're actually have been able to accumulate a data set that's going to be much more appropriate for footfall rather than just prototyping and potentially failing fast and having a lot of resources involved. So these two actually show very, very different type of case studies in terms of, yes, there might be experts in the room, but what is the proxies that we can use and what is at the crux that we really want to address without breaking that creepy threshold? And the other one is it, there is importance in taking the time to build that trust because it will accelerate actually other activities in the future. Now, there is actually a mechanism behind the scenes that Teresa will actually go through in terms of how to build that credibility. But I do want to leave three things with you in terms of how we do this from a case study. And actually, it, it should be common sense, but we all know that sometimes it gets forgotten along the way. The purpose and context is absolutely crucial. If you do not understand what it's for, if we can't engage with the right voices in the community, I err to try and approach it. Or there is a lot of caveats before it gets presented is the community that's getting it done on themselves, because that's literally what's happening in terms of data sometimes. Do they know and understand? Do they acknowledge? Do they want to be part of that process? And how can we iterate and show them a bit of that feedback? Because sometimes you might be okay with the process around uh, using the data, but later on, it's not quite what's been achieved. So Teresa is now going to actually explain, well, what is the academic side of things? How can you build that creative, um, credibility? And there is certain criteria that she'll go through. Thank you, Dorothea. Um, I hadn't thought of them as academic. I sort of think of them as, as practical. Uh, so the next slide, Mark, please. Uh, this this is leading us into the scenario that we want you to work with on an exercise um, to 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 explore ways of building and demonstrating trustworthiness and the the chart that you see in front of you. So this this came out of conversations that I was having with Darte and and a few other students. Uh, relaying the different ways that that I sought to build trust in the data sets that I was working with as a PhD student. And it suddenly occurred to me, well, a lot of that effort on criteria of soundness was about developing the trustworthiness in my data. Uh, in my case, because I was doing ethnographic work in an information science context, it was also important that I be building trust with the community. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But in, in that social science approach, the criterion of, of the criteria of soundness and the criteria of quality that we use are around credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. And documenting those, those processes help um, not only with building quality into the research process, and I think uh, what I'd like to, to suggest to you is that the, the design work we're talking about involves uh, 
thinking of it as a as a project that engages research it is a process of inquiry and so using some of those standards of of quality that come from social research has has merit in in this context uh, and I think discussing things as research projects is very timely. On the next slide, I just wanted to, this was another thing that Dorothea and I uh, have been talking about lately, is that increasingly there are these, these challenges that are put forward and retractions of, of findings that are being published. So, so in the pressure to um, produce information, to provide understanding and share new insights, uh, speed is a factor. So Dorothea has just illustrated really nicely how important it is to make time. Well, sometimes it doesn't feel like we have time. And so we seek to move forward. And it feels like a constant toing and froing between the, the tension of getting information out there and then um, having to retract it if error comes out. Now, what I like about just pointing to this notion of retraction watch is that there is a mechanism here for making public questions and challenges. Just because someone raises a challenge doesn't mean that the research that's being um, questioned is wrong or inaccurate. But what it does is it, it creates that mechanism for feedback so that uh, new insights and new ways of thinking about uh, the, the research can be made public. And that, that feels like a, a way of building accountability, which, which is connected to trustworthiness in this context. Um, now, on the next slide, what I what I wanted to try to do was just very quickly snap up. I'm not intending you to read this. What what I wanted to to share here as a lead into the scenario is is a little of the backstory as to why I'm taking this social science um, putting the social science position forward as a way of trust building, and why I think it's become so naturalized in the work that I do. So 30 years ago, when I started doing research in information science, I, I, was, I, was at, I was part of a group of people who were starting to bring human-centered perspectives into uh, work around the concepts of relevance and uncertainty in decision-making that had at that stage largely been driven by mathematic formulations um, and calculations of, of, of the measure of relevance and uncertainty that a searcher uh, would be experiencing. Now, those measures were all well and good when most of the people using those systems were PhD students or librarians who also had master's degrees and PhDs in the domains in which they were searching. But as our tools started to become used by broader communities and by what at the time was called an end user, then you suddenly had to think differently. You had to understand um, that, that there were perspectives that were not a part of the data sets or a part of the assumptions that were so critical to those calculations of uncertainty and relevance that were underpinning information retrieval systems. So, so I was trying to take a human perspective and ultimately working within a, um, an ethnographic and qualitative framework, which was way back then that was still relatively new, um, we we recognized that data was not collected, it was co-authored, as Qual, who was one of our core methodologists at the time, would have flagged. So, so all the mathematical calculations you see on the left that were how uncertainty and relevance were being measured in the systems that searchers were using ended up for me in the ethnography that I did being simply two questions that I asked over and over again in different ways. What are you looking for and how do you know you have found it? And and in that process of, of um, inquiring and engaging with my informants over two years, I not only had to build trust with them to allow for them to allow me to be in their lives and to understand their, their work, I also had to find a way to defend my data in, in a context where everything on the left about machine perspectives was considered the world and was considered the reality of research in that domain. Next slide, please, Mark. And so out of that, as a consequence, what I what I developed were some some key lessons for process tracing and audit trails from a social science and ethnographic perspective to bring into information science. And just lately, I've been starting to think, well, actually, some of those those basic principles of qualitative inquiry seem really 
relevant for our discussions around working with social data in the context of connected places and smart cities. So recognizing the integration between, you know, as data becomes, observation data connect, collection and analysis are intertwined. Uh, recognizing that if you are going to have a participant driven approach, there are certain sensitivities that you have to be aware of both in collection and analysis and thinking about different criteria of soundness, which goes back to that earlier slide around what what at the time were referred to as dependability audits and confirmability audits. So next slide, please, Mark. So what I want to put to you um, and use in this last interactive session as you start to play with a scenario. We'll see how we go with time is this idea that that perhaps some trust building and trust preserving actions would not only help build public trust, but start to build trust in in the data claims themselves. So demonstrating the trustworthiness of claims that are being made with the data that is collected in different contexts. Nyland refers to this as interactive accounting, and I quite like this idea of thinking about ways of being more participatory in the way that we try to identify where the line is. What is the category that we're going to use? What are those limits? What are our limits for privacy? What constitutes acceptable use and when and how? Um, and how to establish those relationships. So again, all of this takes time, but we can start by just documenting this, starting to identify um, the challenges. And, you know, as some of the conversation that was coming out in the early breakout, we can't do this for everything. We don't have the time to do this for everything, but how can we start to prioritize those areas that are particularly at risk, populations that are particularly at risk, um, where are the vulnerabilities? So having things like a vulnerability and an uncertainty scale can help. So now that means, next slide please, Mark, going into um, a, a hypothetical, trying to build some trust or trustworthiness. I take, I, I recognize I'm only abbreviating um, for, for the sake of what we're, we're the exercise. We're trying to design a system that's going to, to think about the, the, the community itself, the well-being of the people involved, and, and also create a real functioning data public. That means having, having participants who, are, who have the literacies to be able to engage actively in these discussions. Next slide, please. And in this hypothetical, the scenario is, is drawing on some real life challenges that exist in in the smart places strategy and the building of a creation of a charter uh, to, to help with the rollout of, of technologies by both the public sector and the private sector. And your uh, worksheet for the hypothetical is going to give you a number of options that you can use in that. And I'd, I'd ask you to pick at least um, the three critical roles that are part of that scenario. Uh, and just to help you to see that the scenario that I've created is, is not just out of my head. This is as a consequence of conversation with Dorotea and Sam and some of the real life ex experiences they have had. I'd like to bring Sam in at this stage as you start to look at those that document so that she can share a little bit ab about um, the consequences of working in contexts where there is already um, a trust deficit. Where there, where there is distrust that has to be repaired before you can even venture in a project, which is your scenario. Thank you, Sam. Um, thanks very much. Um, appreciate the time's obvious, and so I'll keep it quite brief. Um, but as mentioned before, we're building a, um, uh, a startup around agricultural data um, and really have run into lots of issues around the willingness of farmers particularly to share their data. Um, just to before I before I start that, um, the, the premise really is that we need data and in particular on farm data to help with the innovation required in the um, agricultural sector. In fact, across the, the food production sector, because um, you know if we if we carry on the same kinds of agricultural production methodologies as we do now, um, to feed the planet by 2050 we would be using pretty much all of the forests that are available around about now, um, and agriculture would be using double the emissions that are actually sort of set aside for the entire humanity by that time as well. So there's some really urgent and pressing problems in the agricultural space, 
and, and to address these pressing food and environmental issues really needs us to, 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 to float data that we, can, that we can use and that is reliable. So the problem that we've encountered is that um, many farmers remain very skeptical about parting with their unfarmed data specifically. Um, they are aware that, or, or and I'm generalizing now, that, that data is a valuable asset um, and they want, to be, they want that data to be recognized. Um, at the same time, many farmers have in fact been stunned previously by allowing early agri-tech businesses onto their farms and use of sensors and um, data that has been used then without them knowing in a different way. And so there really is this, this very big um, trust deficit um, between farmers and, and industry um, and, and how to get around that. So one of the things that I think has been hugely valuable in this space is the National Farming Federation's creation of a, a code of conduct, a data code of conduct, and essentially um, really working with all industry players. So that means the farmers themselves, um, commercial and private owners, and um, agri-tech businesses, researchers, academics, government to try and understand what the right framework would be for, um, for the use of data. Um, and that has really allowed farmers to actually, and everybody in the sector actually, to, to work with a real system of um, understanding around what the data is, who owns it, what is private, what is not, how is it being transferred and used in the future. And I, I think that that sort of um, uh, communication and working group has really made huge or you know it's a huge benefit to, to a sector that really requires some kind of framework to move forward um, so uh, you know that is just the, the one example that I that I wanted to to bring to bear and, and to raise at this time thank, thank you Sam oh, what, what I'd like to do and I'm, I'm mindful of the time so I would I would like us to go into breakouts to at least see this role play and and to to maybe have have a starting conversation with with the people that that the forces of technology decide end up in a group with you uh, and then you'll have access to this scenario uh, after after this event as well. So I so we'll 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 take do we have 15 minutes according to my clock we have 15 minutes where where you could start to to chat about about the challenges in that scenario that hypothetical uh, based on some reality and then we'll do a do a very quick uh, coming back together but I'd like you to go away and think more deeply about the challenges presented in that and and see how we can prep to bring this into subsequent conversations as part of the next master classes. So that's why this is the beginning uh, and not the end of this. So Mark, will you drive us from here? Certainly I can uh, put us into rooms again. Can I maybe suggest probably 10 minutes at most? We are at uh, okay. yeah. 11 minutes to, to six. So 10 minutes, uh, I'll put this all into to rooms. If you've got any questions, just put it in the chat and I'll do my best to address. But uh, see you back here in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And share the the link. Thank you. Oops. We're back here. We're back oh. here. Simon, those of you in um, with I was. <laughs> well, John was just giving very good parts there, and suddenly <laughs> we're gone. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you completely, John. And yep. it comes down to that whole bit. And if you're not careful, others can jump in and start saying all sorts of things. Yeah, when, uh, those are completely against it. We blow it out of the water, and once you're, once you're dealing with that, because you haven't dealt with what people want from the beginning, you're just chasing it because you'll never be believed or trusted. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Are we all back in? Ready to go. Yeah. So I'd like. Okay. To Thank, thank you, Sorry. everyone, for your patience with that. I, ho I hope you will continue to work with that um, hypothetical. I welcome your feedback on ways that you ways that you might operationalize a way forward in that scenario that we can then take into the summit in subsequent sessions. Great, <coughs> and thank you very much, Theresa and Dorothea and Sam. Uh, at, at the outset of this, what I've said is what I indicated is that we're, we're running the series of, of masterclasses leading up to the Smart Places Summit June 22nd. 
the 10 masterclasses mean that you've got lots, got quite a few more opportunities to continue the conversation that we started today because the overarching frameworks, whilst we will talk about 5G and IoT and a range of other things, that the meta questions are actually about trust. And I, I note a, a pretty active conversation with Phil Argy and others around trust versus building trust versus trustworthiness. And I think there, there are some concepts that we need to bottom out here. Uh, it's impossible to imagine we would got to the, the absolute bottom of an issue as complex and subtle as trust in a two hour masterclass session. But I, I really would like to thank Teresa and Dorothea and Sam for at least bravely stepping into some of those issues and for providing us some, some really good contextual material to take forward. We deliberately made this the first masterclass because this has to be at the heart of data sharing and use, which is of course what underpins making anything smart, smart city or a smart place. So uh, I, I thank you very much for joining today. Teresa has agreed to stick around after we officially close in one minute's time to stick around for what would otherwise have been drinks and cheese and, and canapes to have a, a conversation with a speaker. I'm not sure Dorothea whether you are available as well, but Teresa has said she's willing to. Um, I think I forgot to introduce myself at the very beginning, uh, but my name is Ian Opperman and, and I'm here representing New South Wales government uh, and helping to, to shape the conversation towards our Smart Places Summit. Nine more to go after today. You don't have to come to all of them, but uh, next week's event is around standards for smart cities, smart places, and it will be a fascinating leap into the conversation around how you approach frameworks, outcomes, indicators, and some of the, the process and technical aspects of smart city, smart places. But always we'll be coming back to we have to be operating in an environment of trust. And with that, I shall leave you folks to, to discuss with the speakers, if they can stay, to talk about the semantics, the important points, and some of the, uh, some of the really more uh, challenging con uh, concepts that we need to deal with. So thank you all very much, and thank you again to our speakers. Thanks for session number one. Great job, great job. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Dorothea and Sam. And thank Thanks, you, Bob. participants. <laughs> Indeed, so, thank you. So